What's up, everyone? This is Faraz Jaka. Today, we're going to be talking about exploitative plays to crush live tournaments. This is going to be a two-part series, and today we're going to start with uh, talking about how and when to increase pre-flop aggression. And part two is going to focus more on turn and river spots. So this is actually the first video I'll be recording for PokerCoaching.com. So I'm going to try kind of a few different styles of uh, talking about topics in this video. And uh, one thing that I'd really love is after you've watched this video to, you know, reach out to me on social media, whether it be, you know, a tweet, a Facebook message, a DM, and just give me any feedback on you know, things that you liked, things that helped you, um, things you'd rather I focus on more, anything you're not seeing that you'd like to see. Uh, you know, my goal is really to make sure I get you guys the content that uh, helps you the most. So I'd love for you guys to communicate with me. And um, yeah, let's jump right into it. So the three pre-flop exploits we're going to talk about today are targeting weak opponents, exploitative blind stealing, three bet attacks, and psychological warfare. We're going to have some fun with that last one. But let's go ahead and get started with targeting weak opponents. So to be a little more specific, the most common weak opponents I'm really looking to find early on when I sit down at the table or who are the loose passive players and who are the spewy opponents. So, you know, loose passive players or, you know, they're going to be the players who, you know, maybe want to see a lot of flops, but if they don't hit, they're not, you know, really going to turn their hands into bluffs. Um, they're not really too focused on what you have. They're just focused on what they have. Um, you know, these are players that aren't going to help you build a huge stack, but you know, you're just going to be able to chip away at them with very little risk. And you know, when they start to put a lot of chips in the pot, you can just get away from your hand or pot control, and it's kind of obvious to just that they have something. And where the spewy opponents are sometimes a lot riskier to play against, they are you know going to do a lot of unpredictable things throwing raises, be in there with hands you can't imagine, and put you in tough spots. And sometimes I, I find players tell me that they're kind of, they don't like playing with those players at the table and um, kind of celebrate that that player is gone. And I, I think that's definitely the wrong kind of mindset because those are actually some of the most profitable players for you to be playing against. And... I totally get that it's uncomfortable because there is more unpredictability when you're playing against them. You're gonna, you might bust out in scenarios that you might not have otherwise bust out in it. In, but you're also going to double up and build huge stacks playing against those type of players. So by kind of getting a better understanding of, you know, what kind of hands and what type of situations you want to be in versus both player types is going to kind of help you not be so afraid of, you know, getting in the mix with those type of players. So one of the first and obvious exploits is just simply opening wider on these weak big blinds. And let's go ahead and jump into a chart on that. So this first chart we're going to jump into here, it's related to opening wider against weak big blinds, but it's also just simply related to the fact that we can open much wider than we've traditionally been taught we can open. And of course, that's no surprise you're going to hear that from me. Um, but just stop and think about all the players like Alex Foxen, Chance Corneth, Ari Engel. You know, a lot of these players are known for opening incredibly wide. Um, and, you know, players will often be like, you know, this player's not going to survive. They're getting lucky. They're spewy, yada, yada, yada. And soon enough, you know, years and years have gone by where 
the success is just undeniable. And I think we've seen enough evidence of that. And really what's, what's going on is that a lot of these charts, they are assuming that everybody is playing like a solver, which means everybody is you know, squeezing perfectly, is three betting perfectly, is flatting the right hands. And in reality, that's not what's happening, especially not in live tournaments. Um, so, so because of that, it allows us to open a lot wider than normal. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch, I'll touch back on this chart and get a little more into that. But um, let's let's first just focus on opening a little wider on the big blind. And so here's two scenarios. One is under the gun plus one, 100 big blinds, and the other is from the cutoff, 60 bigs. So the green is kind of your standard raising range. Uh, the blues are hands you can mix in. And the red are the ones that I have manually put in that I will open exploitatively. Now, this does not mean I will open these every single time or without any reason. If it's my first hand at the table and I have no information about any of these players, then I'm certainly not opening these hands. Um, I need some justification for that. Now, this is gonna bring me to a point that is somewhat obvious, but still completely overlooked and um, and not taken advantage of as much as you should. And that's, you need to come into the table paying attention to every single hand that's being played. And obviously, you know, that's that's tough sometimes playing, you know, these 12 hour sessions, but, you know, I see so many players come into the table and I, I've even fallen guilty of this myself sometimes that you show up, you're on your phone, you're paying attention to something else, you're doing your emails, you're just, you know, dwindling on Twitter. And, you know, really, you need to be paying attention to figuring out, you know, who those big blinds are that you want to attack, um, what type of hands they're playing, how you're going to exploit them. And, you know, if you're only paying attention to the hands that you're in, then, you know, you're missing about 85% of the hands. So it's extremely important that, you, that you're focused, you're paying attention, you know, find some games to play where you guess people's hands, um, you know, whatever it takes to kind of keep you engaged. Um, and, you know, even just make like <clears throat> figuring out what are the things that you need to take care of in your personal life, whether it's your emails and communications, paying your bills and do those things before you come and sit at the poker table even if it causes you to miss the first level of the tournament. Uh, because, you know, to be able to play exploitative poker, you need to have reads on players. And that just means understanding their strategies, understanding what type of hands you're going to play. Um, you know, it's going to make a huge EV difference, and you're going to adjust your ranges drastically. Um, as you could see in some of these spots, we're playing, you know, five to six more percent of hands from early position, that's from 10%. That's huge. Um, and from later positions, you know, possibly as many as much as, you know, 16 to 20% more hands. Um, so, you know, when you see, again, you know, those players I mentioned earlier, um, and myself, you know, raising so many hands, um, it's because we're paying attention. And, you know, we have reasons behind uh, opening such wider range. So let's jump into the second bullet here um, in terms of targeting weak opponents. And that's about opening specific combos that are targeting inappropriate flats behind. Um, so that includes the big blind, which we just talked about. But that also includes, you know, anyone, you know, flatting you from early position, mid position, the button, the small blind um, with hands they really just shouldn't be, be involved in. And um, an example of that is, you know, sometimes where sometimes we see players that are flatting raises with hands like king five suited, queen four suited, um, you know, five seven offsuit or 
dominated aces. And it's one thing to know that, okay, this guy's playing way too loose behind me, but paying attention to the actual hand and understanding how you're going to exploit the hands they're choosing is going to help you figure out which of those red hands in the previous chart that you're going to want to use. So let's talk through some examples of that. So for example here, we open, uh, sorry, we open under the gun 60 big blinds and we are seeing someone flat king two off in the big blind. So this is actually a pretty common mistake I'm seeing, even from a lot of pros actually. Uh, people have learned that you do need to flat really wide from the big blind. Um, you're getting great odds, there's ante in there, people are min raising. But because your range is so tight under the gun, they really should be folding hands like king deuce all the way through king eight, specifically when you're this deep. Um, shallower stacked, you can start to, for example, when we're talking about 20 big blinds, you can start to flat hands like king deuce off in the big blind, um, even versus early position raids. Um, and that has to do with um, less reverse implied odds. That we can do an entire another video on, so I'm not going to get too into that. But here is an example where the big blind is clearly flatting significantly too wide, where you know their range should be king nine off plus, and instead of flatting so many hands uh, that are going to be dominated by us. So what that's going to make me do is that's going to make me assume that they're probably also flatting hands like ace deuce through ace four, which are also fulls in this situation. So I'm going to take hands like king 10 off um, and open them under the gun, even though I'm normally opening, you know, probably king queen off here and maybe not even king jack, but I'm definitely opening king jack knowing this player's in the big blind. Um, you know, ace 10 can easily be a fold this deep under the gun. Uh, I'm opening that now. I might even open ace nine off. So the second one here we pretty much already just talked about. So you can kind of think of these two as we are targeting people who are playing hands with bad kickers relative to what they should be calling. So because of that, we are going to open hands we wouldn't have that are still dominating a significant part of their range. Um, and, and when we do this, we are opening ourselves up to risks because you know, now we're opening hands that you normally don't because they're dominated by other good players that are going to be fighting you in position. But because we have the ability to print money off the players, these players, it, it becomes worthwhile taking on that risk. Uh, so the second category here is where, you know, we're opening early position uh, and someone's flatting hands like queen five suited, eight five suited, so from, from middle position, so now it's kind of obvious when, when you start to see multiple hands like this, you can kind of connect the dots that, okay, this person is overvaluing suited hands. So the way I'm going to exploit them is get flush over flush in a really big pot. So, you know, normally when you're opening, you know, with an ace high flush draw, uh, there's, and someone flats in middle position. There's only so many suited combos they have, but if, if they're opening, if they're calling hands like this, they're going to have triple the amount of suited combos. So because of that, we're, we know that, you know, they're going to end up with a lot of crappy pairs with their kicker, um, a lot of disconnected hands that they're going to have to fold a lot. And again, the flush over flush. So now I'm kind of opening these kind of ace two suited, king five suited, um, you know, I'm going to value Jack Queen off um, because they're going to be in kicker trouble against, you know, a lot of my opens. So, you know, we'll also jump over to the chart that we looked at earlier. So here, uh, this will allow us to kind of visualize what we were just talking about. Again, we can't just open all of these red hands all the time. Um, we really need to understand, you know, why we are opening them. So 
you know, again, if we feel like they're overvaluing their small flushes um, and they're calling big overbets, not even paying attention to what size we bet, then, you know, these become, you know, very powerful versus those type of players. If, you know, they're not, if you feel like the players flying behind um, are, you know, overvaluing their top pair with poor kickers, then, you know, we're going to bias towards these types of opens. Um, and if, again, if we don't have any of that information or we're not paying attention or we're new to the table, um, players are just playing well, then, you know, we default back to this green range. Um, so this is really how you need to be adjusting your opening range uh, constantly by paying attention to the table and uh, making these adjustments. Um, you know, you might be asking yourself, um, you know, about, you know, these red hands on in the cutoff situation. So again, you know, I'm going to start opening these in the cutoff if, um, you know, maybe I feel like the big blind is just, you know, super passive or is easy to barrel and folding top pair to big barrels. Well, you know, then I could just flop a flush draw, you know, bet the turn and bet the, ter you know, bet the turn huge. And, you know, they're full showing me top pair, top kicker, um, you know, those type of players you can just run over. So I'm jumping in there with all sorts of hands if that's the type of player that's in the big blind. Um, or, or, you know, some players, there's a flush on the board and, you know, they're still calling bets. They just, they're just non-believers. Then, you know, these hands are going to be a lot more valuable. Um, you know, players that are calling down with, you know, bad pairs, then, you know, having, having a big pair becomes a lot more valuable. And before we move on from this chart again, I just want to reiterate how big of a deal this actually is. You know, we're talking about increasing the amount of hands we're raising up to 20% possibly here from the cutoff and, um, you know, 6% from early position. Now, like I said, granted, most of the time, it's not going to be all of these hands you're auto opening, but even just opening half of those hands is a big deal. Um, and again, you can only do that if you're paying attention and you are aware and you understand kind of the logic and reason behind, you know, why we're opening those specific hands and who we're targeting at the table. So the next one is pretty straightforward, um, but it's simply just three to four Xing um, versus loose, passive, or splashy big blinds. And the idea here is we're just trying to kick everybody else out. The good players that might flat behind us, we want to get them out of the pot so we can get heads up against the player that we are targeting. Um, and now this is, this is obviously assuming that you know, the loose player in the big line that we're attacking is going to call larger bets and um, isn't really adjusting their flatting ranges. They're just calling everything no matter, you know, what size we raise. So, you know, maybe, maybe it needs to be 5x. Um, that, that's kind of for you to judge based on the situation. But I think that part's pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of just thinking about it and, and um, remembering to use that as a tool in your arsenal. Um, so the next one is isolating weak players with raises or three bets. So, you know, these are the same type of players we talked about earlier when we're targeting in the blinds or people that are flatting inappropriately behind us. Um, you know, we want to figure out who are these players and then we want to get heads up with them. We want them all to ourselves. Um, so the type of hands that we might choose to do this, again, kind of depend on what their weaknesses are. So here's um, a three bet chart, just so we have something to kind of work off of here. Um, you could ignore this title for now. We're going to come back to that a little later. But uh, this spot is what the cutoff should be three betting. Uh, first, a low jack open 60 big blinds deep, and we see it's 7.8% of the hands. And those hands are these orange hands. Again, this is cutoff versus the low jack. So, you know, if we are in a situation where we're trying to isolate a weak player, again, it's just going to depend on what their weaknesses are. 
So if we notice that on you know ace high boards that they are snap calling and just not even thinking about it with you know ace four when the razor was early position, then it's very clear this player is overvaluing ace x. Um, so against that type of player, I'm going to be three betting this ace 10 and I'm even going to open up ace nine and I'm going to three bet those hundred percent for a player like that. Um, you know, I'm probably going to three bet king queen off, king queen suited because, you know, I want to get in there with hands that dominate, you know, you know, assuming he, we think he's calling some stuff like king 10 off or, you know, maybe king five suited. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to isolate them, try to flop top pair against them. Hope they, you know, also have top pair and just, you know, get three huge streets of value. Um, you know, if, if we notice that, you know, they don't really play carefully when straights and flushes hit, um, and they don't really consider that too much, then, you know, I'm going to try to isolate them, you know, with these kind of suited aces. Um, you know, there's also the type of players that are just going to, you know, fold every time they miss. Um, you know, then you could kind of do a mixed strategy against those type of players. Um, obviously, you know, we want to be mindful of, you know, how often we've been doing this and are they getting fed up with us? Are there other players behind us that might start forbetting us? And, you know, those are things we want to kind of pay attention to. But, um, yeah, that's just, you know, one example of how, um, you know, we're going to open up our three betting ranges to get heads up versus the player that we're targeting. Or actually, just before we move on, um, you know, just two more thoughts there. You know, there's also players that, and even, even good players, pros sometimes I see, will be calling three bets too wide with hands like, you know, 7-5 suited, 5-8 suited, um, you know, just thinking they could outplay you post-flop. Um, and, you know, against those guys, you can start three betting these, you know, 7-8 suited, 8-9 suited, 8-10 suited, 9-10 suited. You're just dominating a lot of their flats. Um, and you just want to get them, you know, to play you out of position um, where, you know, they're, they're just going to be out kicked, out flushed. Um, and they're just not going to be able to continue often enough with how weak their range is. And they're also just making a lot of money just C bet in the flop and, you know, just having them fold so often. Um, and then the last thought I want to share here was, you know, if it is the spewy player that you're trying to isolate, um, you need to be mindful of are they also, you know, playing unpredictably pre flop where they're going to just four bet random hands and fight back. If that's the case, then I'm not going to be isolating them with a six suited, a seven suited, you know, even, you know, king 10 suited, because it's going to be hard to continue versus four bet with them. Um, something like king queen suited, I'll still probably feel comfortable continuing against them versus four bet. Um, something like king queen off, not so much. So you kind of have to make sure you don't waste those hands um, and you just want to flat those. But again, if it's, if they're passive, pre-flop you know there's a lot of players that you know they'll make moves on you post-flop um or they'll be really sticky post-flop but pre-flop they're you know they're not really you know doing four bets or you know blowing the plot pot up too much you know against those guys you're safe to just kind of three bet these hands so back to our list of targeting loose passive and spewy opponents. Um, the last one on that list, sorry, the last one on that list was limping with weak players behind if necessary. So what that means is, you know, up here we talked about an example where, you know, we're opening and this player's flatting queen five suited, five eight suited behind us. Now against that player, it doesn't matter if you raise or not, they're still going to call. So in that situation, you're raising because they're trying to kick out everyone else. Uh, and they're going to call anyways, whereas, you know, you'll get players that are tight against raises and they just want to see the flop for cheap uh, and they're positioned behind you. So now you need to limp to keep them in. Um, so that's just another thing that you need to kind of pay attention to, you know, is this weak player to your left or are they to your right? 
And if they are to your left, are they calling these raises extremely loose, or do you need to limp to keep them in the pot? So we don't need to go in too much further detail on that one. It's really just a matter of you know being aware. So that just about wraps up all the topics I want to cover in terms of targeting weak opponents. So let's jump into number two, exploitative blind stealing. This one is going to be a much quicker topic. Um, we're all familiar with blind stealing. Um, so this is just kind of a reminder that, you know, when you're shallow stacked or when average stacked is, you know, small, then, you know, stealing blinds becomes really significant. And it's really what kind of helps you pull ahead of the pack. Um, you know, it really has a compounding effect because someone who is able to steal blinds effectively in a tournament where, you know, the average stack might be 25 big blinds and a lot of players are hovering around, you know, 15, 20 big blinds, you know, the player that dwindles down to 12 big blinds and then doubles up with aces is only at 27 big blinds, whereas the player who is effectively able to blind steal their way up to, you know, 24 big blinds, then doubles up is all of a sudden at 50 big blinds. So it really has this exponential effect. Um, so, you know, when you're under 30 big blinds, um, you know, blind stealing becomes, you know, pretty important. Um, that's not to say it's not important all the time, but, you know, the, the percentage of which you're increasing your stack by um, does make a big difference. So in terms of the type of hands we're going to be doing a lot of blind stealing with is it's going to be blockers. We want big cards in our hands. And the reason for that is two things. Um, one is, you know, we want to be blocking the hands that are going to be reshoving on us. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we're opening these 20 big blind stacks, it's going to be, you know, ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-10, suited aces, king-queen, um, king, you know, king-10 suited type hands. Um, you know, these are the kind of hands that we get reshoved with. So, you know, when we have an ace in our hand, when we have a king in our hand, we're blocking that from happening. Um, but that's really only half the reason. The, the other very important thing is, you know, when you're this shallow, uh, reverse implied odds become less which means you're not as worried about being out kicked and you're more worried about just having a bigger pair. So, you know, when you open a hand like king six and the flop is, you know, king nine four, um, you know, you're pretty happy to get in all your chips. And, um, you know, a lot of times you're going to be up against a blind who might have um, second pair, bottom pair, and they're going to be forced to pay you off um, because of how shallow you are. So, um, you know, that, that is actually a mistake that I see a lot, especially in live poker. Um, you know, if you notice, again, these green hands are the GTO hands. Um, and, you know, you see a lot of players opening, you know, 7-8 suited, 6-7 suited. Um, it, it really doesn't make sense. You know, those aren't the hands you want to be opening. 20 big blinds deep, um, under the gun plus two. Um, you know, you even notice, even with my exploitative um, raises, um, you know, I'm not choosing those hands. The hands that I decide to go exploitative with are, you know, these suited king blockers, um, you know, ace deuce, even 10 jack off, queen 10 off, um, you know, these Broadway cards that are going to flop, you know, bigger pairs than, you know, what the big blind will when they're calling us with, you know, queen five off. Um, you know, we want them to have, you know, the second pair, you know, with the five in their hand um, when we have, you know, top pair with a jack or ten. Um, you know, again, you know, I'd much rather steal with ace, eight, ace, seven than seven, eight suited. Um, now, of course, that changes when you're, you know, 60 big blinds deep uh, because your incentives are different. You know, when you're 60 big blinds deep, you're not just trying to flop a pair of aces and get it in by the turn. Um, so that's super important. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so very important um, to understand, um, you know, what your opening range should be and when you are going exploitative, which hands to choose to go exploitative with. Um, and you can see here that, you know, we're able to, you know, increase our opening range 
from, you know, I think N plus two from 16% to as much as 20 to 25%, um, big difference. So, you know, this player who's able to pull that off is you know, going to be stealing, you know, blind significantly building their stack up. Um, and again, you can't just, you can't just do that whenever you want. You do that if you notice that players are not, you know, reshoving or three betting or flatting enough behind you. So, you know, sometimes you just get in these moments where you notice that people are playing really tight. You know, maybe it's, you know, because it's, you know, deeper in the tournament. Um, you know, maybe you just overhear players talking and, you know, they're saying things that are implying that they're going to be playing tight. Um, you know, maybe it's that they're scared of you. You know, sometimes you go on a run of cards or for whatever reason you haven't been, you know, beat out of a pot um, or you just have a good image. Uh, that allows you to, you know, get away with some of these things. Um, so let's jump over here to the cutoff. Uh, so, you know, same concept, just different hands here. But again, we're, we're choosing to go wide with these blockers, you know, these King X offsuits, the Queen eight, you know, any ace X at this point. Um, and, you know, with this example on the cutoff, it's, you know, good players that are playing GTO preflop. They're going to reshove out of the blinds with, you know, hands like pocket twos, threes, fours. You know, they're going to take these suited aces, reshove on you. They're going to take 10 jack suited, 9 10 suited, king 10 suited. They're going to reshove on you. But if you notice that, you know, versus late position raises, that 30 big blind stacks are just flatting those hands, now that allows you to open these red hands up. And again, the reason you don't want to normally open these hands up is because when you raise king 8 off in the cutoff, all the players behind are going to reshove on you with hands like threes, fours, and twos. They're taking hands that are flipping with you and they're making you fold. So you're not able to realize your equity because you can't see the flop. And that's disastrous. That makes opening these hands disastrous. That makes opening all these hands disastrous. But if they're flatting those hands, then you're able to see those three cards in the flop. And that's what enables you to open these hands. Um, so, you know, pre-flop, you know, 20 big blind, 15 big blind, I'd say a lot of players are pretty good at that these days. You know, even the less experienced players or, you know, less studious players, the amateurs, um, you know, generally people do understand that you could reshove small pairs, um, you know, but when it gets to the 30 big blinds, the 25 big blind stack, you know, we're still only seeing kind of some of the more advanced players do that. They were kind of studying these charts. Um, you know, that said, you, you still do see players, you know, with that weakness in the 15, 20 big blind stack. So really pay attention to if people are reshoving correctly or not. And, um, you know, if you notice they're not, you know, that's going to allow you to steal so many more blinds and really has an exponential effect on your tournament. So the second bullet here is simply about raise sizing. And that's that when you're stealing blinds, you really just want to use the smallest size possible. And the idea here is, you know, you, every time you raise to steal the blinds, you're, you know, risking, you know, 2.2 big blinds to win, you know, what's in the pot. And if you could risk two big blinds instead of 2.2 big blinds, you know, that's going to go a long ways. You know, when you get reshoved, you know, you're not wasting those 2.2, you're wasting two, and that adds up over the long run. So definitely go as small as possible if players are letting you get away with it. Um, so an example of that is, um, you know, ge generally you, when you're deeper, 40 big blinds, 50 big blinds, maybe even at 30, you do want to raise bigger from late position, from cutoff and button, you want to go closer to 2.4, 2.5x. And the reason is you want to give the big blind a worse price because they're going to be flatting very wide. Whereas when you're early position under the gun, big blind needs to play pretty tight still because of how strong your range is. Um, so that's why, you know, it's okay to just use the 2.2 size from early position, but from late position, you want to go a little bigger. And, um, but again, if you notice that players are playing, you know, su super tight um, and they're folding to the min raise or the 2.2 from even from your late position raises, then just go smaller. 
um, you know, just test the waters, pay attention. Um, sometimes it's very obvious when the table is playing very tight. You just notice someone raises and the table goes, you know, just rapid fire folds. Or, you know, maybe they, they do that for certain players because they're scared of them or they perceive them as tight. So just kind of pay attention and ask yourself if you think the table's playing, you know, overly tight or not. And, you know, even paying attention to the raise size. You know, you'll get times where someone will full show, you know, ace X from the big blind versus a late position raise. And, you know, if you see that type of stuff happening, then you know you can kind of use that smaller sizing. So let's jump into the next topic here, topic number three, uh, three bet attacks. So when to attack with three bets and what hands to choose. So the first time, the first reasoning we'll, that we'll find ourselves often wanting to use is simply players that are opening too wide. So, you know, similar to blind stealing, when you're three betting, you know, you're simply, you know, risking some amount of chips to win what's in the middle. And if a player is opening too wide, they're just not going to be able to defend enough. And by defend, I mean either flat and contest you on the flop or, you know, four bet your pre-flop or shove all in depending on the stack sizes. So when someone is opening too wide, that's the reason why we call that exploitative by opening wider than you're supposed to because it can be exploited. So the way you exploit that is you simply can start three betting them wider. So the same way uh, we, you know, widened our, our opening range, you know, with those, you know, red highlighted hands, you know, you want to figure out what your three betting range is and, you know, extend that further versus players that are opening too wide. Also players that are folding too much to three bets. Um, so again, some people will just fold show you ace queen. Um, you know, sometimes you don't always get to see the hands, you know, maybe it's someone you've seen, you know, play on a live stream, um, or you just kind of overhear them talking to their neighbor saying what they fold. Um, you know, just really, again, this is the importance of paying attention because if you can pinpoint who's folding too much to three bets, who's calling too wide, um, you know, you can play exploitatively tight for certain players and just have the nuts every time. And, you know, versus the ones playing too wide, you know, you could just be three betting them like crazy, you know. Um, number three. So three is pretty important and um, undermentioned, I noticed. It's, you know, players who are taking hands that they could be jamming, you know, often and they're just flatting them or, you know, they're not four betting hands. And what this does is it allows you to realize your equity. So, you know, when you look at three bet charts, lots of times, um, you know, when you're 35 big blinds deep, for example, you don't really want to be three betting hands like king queen suited from a lot of positions because, you know, it's just, it's a waste for someone to open. You three bet king queen suited, king jack suited. They shove all in with pocket fives and you just fold it with a hand that, you know, plays really well post flop and is flipping versus a lot of the hands they're jammed all in with. So that's why we flat king queen in those scenarios. But, you know, let's say you're notice a player who's just scared to get it all in pre flop and wants to see the flop, wants to see that there's no ace there and then get it in. Um, you know, there's guys that will even flat jacks with 30 big blinds versus three bet because they just want to see the flop and make sure it's safe. Um, versus those guys, you know, you could start taking hands like, you know, king 10 suited, king 9 suited, king jack suited, king queen suited, you know, ace 5 suited. Um, and you don't need to worry about wasting them because you're not going to get jammed on. Or when you do, they really have the goods and it's not a big deal to fold because they're jamming so infrequently. So um, just thinking about... Am I going to get to realize my equity um, is a big deal. And by realizing your equity, we're saying that you're going to be able to see those three cards in a flop um, often. You know, of course, it's not every time because, you know, there still might be jamming queens plus. But it's are you going to get to see those three cards, you know, more often than you're supposed to? Um, if that's the case, then, you know, you can go ahead and three bet more liberally versus those types of players. Um, and the next is um, isolating players who make big mistakes post-flop. We already pretty much covered this um, earlier when we talked about, you know, forcing our way into pots 
with uh, weaker players. So I think we could skip on that one for now. Um, and the last one here is when you've been card dead. Um, so this is something I do often. If you know, because we have to remember that majority of the times no one is actually seeing our cards. So you know, sometimes people will, you know, they're they've been running into a lot of good hands and they're opening a lot and they're playing really tight. They're just running into good hands and in their head they think of themselves as a tight player. But you have to realize no one else is seeing your hands. So as far as the table knows, you know, you're playing like a lunatic right now, um, especially if they don't know you and it's the first time they've played against you. So, you know, you have to be hyper aware of your image and what cards have shown down. So, you know, sometimes I'll come to the table and for whatever reason, I just haven't played a hand. You know, I've played very few hands for three hours and it's just because I'm card dead. But... You know, it gives people the image that, okay, Faraz is playing tight today. Um, and, and I noticed that when I open, that everyone just snap folds. Um, so, you know, you need to kind of pay attention and get a feel for what your image is and um, how quickly people are folding to you. And sometimes people will even make comments at the table, you know, either subtly where they think, you know, you can't hear them or sometimes even out loud, people just give you information. Um, so yeah, really just be hyper aware and, you know, take advantage. You know, if you haven't opened for a long time, even if there's, you know, good players at the table, uh, you can take some of those red hands that we saw and, um, you know, three bet, you know, wider than you normally would. And, you know, a good player is going to overfold to you unless they know that you're doing that, which, you know, in most cases, there's no way they're ever going to know that. So really, you know, a lot of this is, a lot of these five points are really just, you know, knowing that you can use these tools, use these ideas, uh, being aware of them, and just not, not being scared to kind of experiment. You know, sometimes, sure, you're going to take these spots and they're not going to work out. Um, it could just be that you're running into hands. Uh, you know, you really need a large sample size before you can really say that, you know, these are working out or not. So kind of have faith in the system and the process and, you know, experiment with these things and put yourself out there. Don't worry about the result. Um, you know, I, I used to play basketball and, you know, when I would change my form, you know, the first time you change your form, things don't work out because you know, you're still kind of learning how to use this new form and trying to perfect it. And you're gonna notice that happens too here. You know, when you start you know, trying to put yourself out there, you're gonna run into some mistakes, you're gonna run into some scenarios you weren't prepared for. But you know, don't let that shy you away because you know, it, there, there is a transition period when you are trying new things. So you know, stick with it and um, you know, get a large sample size of experimenting in there. Actually, there is one more bullet here I almost forgot about. When players are unconsciously telling you to. Now, that sounds a little bizarre because no one just tells you to 3 bet them. But what I mean here, again, I kind of touched on this in the last one, that people give you a lot more information than they should. And you really need to use that against them. Um, you know, players will talk about their strategy uh, you know, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll make comments that, you know, or imply, you know, what they're willing to call a three bet with, um, how they would respond to things. And, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's people just trying to show off their knowledge. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll, there's a pro at the table and they want to impress them by, you know, showing them that, Hey, you know, I know what I'm doing. And, you know, first of all, you should never do that. Um, you know, the, your goal at the table, you know, is is to, you know, minimize the amount of information your opponents have against you because that's going to allow them to play better versus you. But, you know, a lot of people reveal information like that. Um, so, you know, through that, through how quickly people are folding, um, you know, players will talk about making the money and how important that is to them. Um, you know, there's just there's just all sorts of things that you can pay attention to at the table um, and kind of figure out who cares about caching, who doesn't. Um, 
you know, who cares about, you know, rebuying versus who really doesn't want to rebuy, um, you know, kind of understanding like who the satellite players are, um, you know, stuff like that. You could kind of just try to label players that who are going to be the easier players to pick on and, uh, you know, go after them. You know, some players will see, you know, a tough player running over the table and they'll think like, ah, oh, I got to, you know, stand up to this guy or he's going to, you know, you know, bully the table. It's not, it's not your job to bully the table or sorry, to, to bully the table captain. Um, you know, it can be, but it doesn't need to be. So, you know, don't, don't find, you know, difficult challenges, you know, go after the low hanging fruit. Now to the fourth topic I want to talk about. And one of my favorites actually is psychological warfare. Um, you know, this is something I don't hear too many people talking about in their strategy videos. And I don't actually see too many players implementing at the table either. Um, you know, we all, we all know there are players out there that, you know, are able to kind of talk their way into winning pots, you know, tilting players, um, goading players into a fold, into a call. And a lot of these players are just naturals at it. And, you know, there's not a lot of people kind of encouraging students to, you know, try to think outside the box. So, you know, I, I really think this can be an entire video in itself, uh, maybe even a video series. And, um, you know, if that's something that you guys are interested in, then definitely give me that feedback and I'm happy to kind of go deeper. But, you know, in this video, I just... I just want to kind of bring it to the surface because I think it's just something that if you start to think about and understand that there's opportunity here, then, you know, that's kind of the first step to being able to take advantage of it. Um, so let's jump over to the next slide over here. So here we have... Um, kind of a few different things that a few different kind of characters that you come across at the poker table often and you know you have this little zen frog here in the middle with a big smile on his face this is this is who you want to be um you know there's the emotional player you know getting excited about his big stack uh, you know, big quads he just got, yelling, and then as soon as he has a bad hand, he's going to, you know, be on the downward spiral. Um, you know, there's the macho guy who's talking when he has chips or kind of making fun of you, making subtle comments when he wins pots. Um, you know, there's, there's the insecure guy who, you know, is going to keep kind of bringing up the things that, you know, make him sound better or sound confident. Um, the egotistical player, um, the ones that are going to, you know, brag about, you know, knowing how they know how to make the right play all the time and how, you know, you know, really pointing out other people's mistakes um, and just showing off their knowledge about the game. You know, these characters are at every single table um, and they're all weaknesses. They're all, you know, they're all very exploitative weaknesses. So let's talk through a little bit about how, you know, you can exploit some of these human weaknesses. And there's not really, you know, a straightforward rule book on how to go about this. But, you know, it's really two things. It's one, you know, being aware. The other is experimenting. And the third is, you know, becoming good at understanding how other people think. Um, how other people experience life, what other people are feeling. And by kind of experimenting, by talking to people, by hearing how they think, by asking them questions, by, you know, you kind of will learn to understand people, you know, better that way. And in turn, that's also going to make you better at being able to push their buttons. Um, you know, and I'm, you know, away from the table, you know, people tell you I'm one of the nicest people you've ever met. But at the table, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not, 
I'm not trying to be, you know, the nicest guy to play against. You know, I'm here. I'm here making mental warfare to make, you know, your life as difficult as possible. And, you know, I, it's important you do that with class. You know, you never want to go, you know, out of line and, um, you know, you know, do something inappropriate. But, you know, you know, you need to kind of understand where that line is and, you know, what's good, fun, competitive spirit um, versus what's kind of, you know, pushing that line. So, you know, let's just kind of talk through some examples. So the first thing that's important is kind of understanding your image, you know, who you are, what you appear, um, you know, what, what your own kind of, um, what, what the kind of stereotype of who you are. So, you know, let's say you're the type of person that just talks a lot and you know that, you know, you know, you're a talker and you know, People sometimes maybe get a little annoyed if you talk too much and you're aware of that. So you try to keep that in check, but that's also just who you are. So use that to your advantage, right? We see people who do that all the time. You know, they talk people's ear off and they're kind of tippy-toeing between this line of, you know, man, this guy talks a lot. He's kind of funny. You kind of like him, but he's kind of gets annoying sometimes, especially when I'm losing. Um... So, you know, you can use that to your advantage. Um, you know, there's the other type of person who, you know, let's say you're a really slow player and you kind of tank a lot and it annoys people. Um, you know, there's people who use that to their advantage. Um, you know, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging you to kind of slow down the game to the point where it's, you know, bad for poker. Because um, I, I do think that's bad for poker. But... You know, sometimes there's just a player that's a little overly impatient and is not being reasonable with you. And if you could sense that and, you know, it can get him off his game, you could use that to your advantage. Um, I'll talk about myself. So, you know, my, you know, when people see me, I'm, I'm generally the guy at the table that, you know, I'm pretty calm. Not a lot of things bother me. I take things in good spirit and I always have a smile on my face. And people will even joke around about how it's so hard to piss me off. So knowing that that's my image, I exaggerate my image. I exaggerate my personality. You know, sometimes things do piss me off. Things do get me going, but I don't show that. You know, I, I kind of exaggerate the personality that people know of me and use that to my advantage. So, you know, um, I'll just find ways to pick fights with people at the table where, you know, I raise the big blind and, well, well, sorry, first of all, identify who who are the players at the table that I think have a short temper, that might be, you know, in not the greatest mood because they're getting bad beat, they're huffing and puffing, they're talking under their breath. And, you know, so I've already made a mental note of kind of who these players are because I, I see that as a weakness. Um, you know, when I'm pissed off, which it does happen, I'm human, I don't show that. I don't reveal that to anyone because that's you're revealing to people weakness, you know, that you're human and you don't want to show that at the table. Um, so when I notice that about a player um, and, you know, I'm going to try to find a way to take advantage of it. And, you know, I, I totally get that that's not for everyone that, um, you know, you might be uncomfortable being the bad guy in the moment, but you know, I will say this. I pick on players all the time. I get players who want to kill me at the table. But as soon as we step away from the table, you know, people are cool with me. And it's, again, it's because, you know, I do it with class. I do it with a smile on my face. With, I do it with a smile on my face. And, um, you know, I, I know where the line is. So, you know, if you, if you have it in you to experiment, you know, with this, then go for it. So... You know, one of the easiest and most obvious things to do is just to show people a bluff. Um, you know, that's not rude. It's not out of line. It's not against the rules. You know, when, you know, poker was originally just a home game amongst friends, you know, taking the piss out of each other. Um, you know, good competitive fun. So, you know, if you see someone kind of huffing and puffing or in a bad mood or being rude to the dealer, whatever, um, or, or especially, you know, I'll often target, you know, a player who has a huge stack that's to my right. Um, 
you know, if I got a huge stack behind them, because clearly that is a very, you know, important stack for me to kind of go after. So, you know, three bet, show a bluff, show one card, and you already know that this player is, you know, likely to kind of be short tempered because you've been observing them. And, you know, it's going to lead them to make poor decisions. You know, at the end of the day, that's all this game is. You know, you're, you're trying to make better decisions than your opponent. And you're, you know, doing things, you know, with your strategy to make them make poor and incorrect decisions against you. And, um, you know, another part of this game is keeping your composure. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, showing occasional bluffs, really throws people off their games. Um, you know, exaggerating your personality, um, you know, just saying the things you would say to people, you know, to a friend at the basketball court, um, you know, when you're battling or, you know, if you're playing tackle football with a friend and, um, you know, what, what just makes it a little tougher is in this situation, when people are winning and losing money and their emotions are all over the place and, you start to kind of say these things to them, you know, people just can't handle it and it really gets them off their game. So, you know, I, I haven't really thought through what the best way to kind of teach this is, but over my career, you know, this has, you know, won me so many chips um, and a lot of EV over the years. So um, I, I know there's a ton of value in there. So, you know, that's a topic that, you guys are interested in you know for starters just be aware of it think about it start experimenting at the table um you know i'm happy to talk with you about funny stories of things you tried the things i tried um and uh you know if there's a lot of interest then i'm to totally happy to try to think of how to you know turn that into um, a video or a course okay so that's going to bring us to a wrap on this video and i know when i'm um watching learning content, um, you know, I, I always want to make sure I have a way to really retain that information. So, you know, I really think one of the best uh, ways to retain the information is to, you know, to, to work on them right away, to, you know, find ways to implement them in your game, to experiment. Um, so I'm going to leave you guys with some homework. Um, they're going to be related to the different subjects we talked about. Um, so the first one here is... So first of all, we're going to identify the following players during your next session. So, you know, whether you're playing a home game, a cash game, a tournament, um, it could be an online tournament. But, you know, I, I think these are a lot more applicable live since we're talking about, you know, a lot of exploit, exploitative things that revolve around kind of getting to know your opponents. Um, so, um, you know, which can be done online, but uh, I think you just get more info live. So first... Uh, players who are flatting inappropriately and how you can exploit it, whether or not you receive the appropriate hands to actually do it. So, you know, this is referring to um, the first topic we talked about, targeting weak opponents. We talked about um, raising the big blind to weak players, um, you know, understanding if they're passive or if they're kind of spewy um, and unpredictable and raising a lot. Um, and then, you know, there's also the players that are just flatting with really bad hands behind us. And we talked about different ways we can kind of get in pots with them. And again, the important thing there was that we choose the right hands based on kind of the inappropriate, you know, ranges they're flatting with. So simply, you know, identify who that player is at the table. And if you get the right hands to do it, then do it. And if you don't, then don't force it. Um, Second is, uh, during the next session, identify who the good three-bet candidates are um, and think through uh, which hands you can three-bet them with. So, you know, as soon as you identify who those players are you can target, you know, even if you they open and you look down and you see do seven off, throw it away, but don't just stop there. You know, ask yourself, you know, what would I do if I had ace five suited here? If I had ace 10 off, if I have king 10 suited and think through your entire range and, um, you know, run through the scenario. Um, so pinpoint that and check that off after you did it. You know, if you need to, you know, take your phone right now, take a picture of this and pull it up during your next session so you don't forget. Um, last one, not for the faint heart. 
find the players to label as having vulnerable ego, emotions, insecurity, confidence, and think through or execute a potential attack. Um, so again, this is a lot of experimentation here. And if you don't feel like you're ready to do it yet, um, at least just label who those players are so that you're aware of it. Um, because, you know, it's, it's really easy to get caught up in, you know, ranges and charts and, you know, the math and fundamentals of the game. But, you know, so much of the value in live poker is coming from paying attention to these things and understanding your players. So, you know, if all you can do is just be kind of aware of, you know, who those vulnerable players are, then that, that's a great start. Um, and, and you'll intuitively start to kind of find ways to exploit that just by being aware of it. Um, if you guys end up with any fun scenarios or funny hands that came up, uh, picking on players or going to war with people or even things that didn't work out for you that you tried, share them with me on social media, um, you know, or, or wherever you're able to contact me. Um, you know, to Twitter, Facebook, my Facebook fan page, you know, those are the best places. Um, but yeah. And uh, also, you know, this was my first video. Um, I displayed things in a few different ways. Uh, when we talked about the opening ranges, I showed the charts with the red exploitative hands. Uh, when we did the three bet ranges, um, I didn't want to take too much time. So I didn't I didn't show the chart with the exploitative hands. So I'm curious to kind of hear about those type of things. Do you prefer me to kind of go in more detail? Do you like when I draw out the charts? Or, you know, does that get a little too long winded and you just want to see me kind of talk uh, through bullet points and go through them a lot quicker? Um, so whatever feedback you can give me on what helps, then I know to kind of prioritize my time on certain things and whether or not I should spend the time on doing those charts or just stick with the bullets. Um, any other topics you want to hear about, um, anything at all, like feedback is great. It's going to help me help you guys better. So thanks again and see you on the next video.